Hi. <laughs> welcome back and welcome to 2022. It feels weird because we didn't do a January learning deployed and we have a new face right. and a That's young old. face. A young face. A young face. A face from the past, right? Yes. Yes. A constant face. A blast. We adore when we have Maggie. So whenever <laughs> we have Maggie, you know that it's going to be fun because that means we've got chocolate. So, that's right. <laughs> so that's what we're doing tonight. And we've got Charlie Mackey. Charles. Mackey. <laughs> Charles good. Charles good. Yeah, Charlie or Charles. I guess depending I'm, on how friendly we are. And the new cheese monger. Yep. Do I do a bio? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Let's, a lot of people know me from exactly. Mazzaro's. I was a cheesemonger at Mazzaro's for a bunch of years. And then a guy that worked for me opened Brooklyn South, where I was a cheesemonger there for even more years. But a lot of cheese experience, New Orleans, North Carolina, North Carolina and Virginia, uh, a couple of Whole, Whole Foods. And uh, I learned cheese at a French brasserie in New York City that had 100, 160 wines by the glass and 150 cheeses in the back of the restaurant. So great place to learn wine and cheese and make a lot of cheese plates yeah that's the quick summary <laughs> that's your story you're sticking with that <laughs> yeah, one with <laughs> so yeah so we've got charlie doing cheese tonight we've got maggie doing chocolate and i'm i'm going to be talking about wine and we're just gonna roll through we'll start off with the cheeses and do two cheeses and then we'll be pairing those with the two white wines and then we'll move into the chocolates and we're pairing those with two red wines so we're gonna start out. There you go. In Oregon, and we have a little lazy Susan table. We're in our new space, so if it looks different and you don't see the lock, that's why. Um, you hear an echo. Yeah, echo, exactly. Echo. <laughs> we, we, we haven't built it out right? yet. Yeah, exactly. We haven't built it out yet, so um, so it's just uh, not necessarily a raw space, but a uh, a former gym space and it's you know just pretty much got the the furniture that you see us sitting on and a few other things um and then we do like tastings our must must here once a month and we do our stretch sip and stretch and a few other things but basically this is our private event space until we begin construction and begin our our permitting process to be able to open this side to the public um it, as our expanded retail cheese heavy charcuterie mm -hmm. heavy side of the market and then that will be our other side will be more dined in and more of an elevated and very curated menu over there so can you talk a little bit more about the sip and stretch because it sounds like a lot of fun yes <laughs> <laughs> i can talk about the sip and stretch basically um every other saturday um pretty much the i think it's the second saturday and the fourth saturday of the month we're doing sip and stretch and we have different instructors and um, it's very, very light yoga-ish, if that's what you want to call it. I'm gonna step up and drink. Yay! Enjoy. Yay! Good to see you guys again. We were just Sorry, we were just talking about sip and stretch. Okay, <laughs> so they attended our sip and stretch, actually. Oh so, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so yay. And we haven't even started, so you guys showed up just on time. <laughs> And so, yeah, so the sip and stretch is just, it, it's basically, it's like three little, um, like wine tasting and, um, and basically like we start off with a tasting and then you do your first session of stretching and then we do the second tasting and then the second stretching session and then the third, and then you're welcome to hang out or come next door and have lunch, go shopping, do whatever you want to do. This, um, on the 12th, this weekend is local Topia, which is right around the corner. So. It's an easy walk around the corner to just go do that next as well. So, yeah, nice. that's pretty much what Sip and Stretch is. Fun. So, yeah. So we'll get into the wine tasting. So, yeah, so like we're saying, we're doing a cheese and chocolate and wine. And so we're starting off in Oregon. Oregon, sorry, not Oregon. <laughs> Oregon. And this is Alexana. And they are, this is... I'm probably going to do my usual butchering of um, his name, but Dr. Medea Ravana. And um, he is, he moved. Huh? I do. See? We <laughs> always, we here, always, I'm like, wait, I already took this off. Here we go. Yay. Yeah, so 
we're going to start off with this with the Pinot Gris is number one, and then we've picked we've um, paired that with the Louvre, which Charlie's going to show you guys. Yep. Six. Six. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> yep, perfect. Thank you, Maggie. So yeah, so basically, um, so Dr. Ravana was, um, he, he moved to the States in 1973 from India. He's a cardiologist in Houston, and he just kind of fell in love with wine, honestly. And he, coming from India and just traveling around the world and getting to know wine and falling in love with it, it really became a passion of his that he really wanted to deep dive. And he really felt that Oregon, California and also Argentina really are great, fantastic sites to make wine. And he thought that they were basically like world-class sites to be able to produce wines that would rival France. So that's what he did is he basically sought out this very special property. And you can see the picture is of their property. That's the Rivana um, vineyard. And so that was their first property. And they also have cabs in Napa, and so that is actually called Ravana. And then they also have Horizon del Sol, which is in Mendoza. So this is Pinot Gris, and Pinot Gris, this is actually the second site, I want to say, that Pinot Gris was planted in in Oregon, ever in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Their next-door neighbor is the first site that Pinot Gris was planted in in Oregon. So this is more of an Alsace, Alsacian grape varietal. Um, it's a white, it's nice and light, but it's got beautiful aromatics in my opinion. Um, I love like the stone fruit of the Pinot Gris. It's also aged four months on the leaves. So it gives it a nice richness and more complexity. And I think it's gonna go delicious with the cheese. Yeah, go, um, yeah. do you wanna talk have, about the cheese? Yes. 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 <laughs> Um, Lou Bergier Pichin sounds French. It's in the uh, northwest part of part of Italy, uh, Italy but it's uh, kind of in, in an area that has French influence uh, to it. And it's a un, it's a cow's milk cheese, which is sem, semi soft, has a natural rind to it. It's uh, something that's cave aged and you know old world style caves that. Uh, yeah, there's some little like micro, that little grayness minor, to it. minor holes to it. It's a, a semi-soft, very easy eating cheese. So mm -hmm. the French have a kind of a more famous Tome de Savoie, a, a Toma, Tome style cheese. The Italians have Toma. Um, this is kind of a boutique version, uh, not part of the Toma regulated area. Toma is just like in wine where you have DO or AOC or DO, uh, Dio designations, Spain, France, uh, Italy. This is a, in the style of a name controlled cheese from, from Piedmont, but uh, not part of the Dio. So one of my all time favorite cheeses. It's like those beer flavored beers like Pilsner or Lager, where it's just kind of tastes straightforward. There's simple milkiness, there's saltiness, there's great acidity uh, at times. As you eat closer to the rind, it can have a little barnyardy, funky note or mushroom, mushroom-like note, but um, melts like a dream. For those that want to find nuance in it, it can be you can find the nuance. Otherwise, it's just it's, it's a cheese that any any anyone would want to eat, eat or uh, at, at least try. And uh, versatile, kind of takes on the flavors of whatever you're putting with it. So better at room temperature. Always better at room temperature. Yeah, so it's. Semi-firm, maybe not semi-soft. So um, let it let it come up. This is this type of cheese where I might leave half of it sit under my cheese dome yeah. all night long. Have it have it with breakfast. Flavors really come out depending on how room how warm your room temperature is. But it kind of has a tendency to taste almost like a Gruyere. Yeah. yeah so the group. sharpness. Kind yes. Of. Mm -hmm. Nice, smooth, but sharp and also cow's milk. Yeah. Also aged aged in the Alps. This is more yeah. foothills of the mm -hmm. Alps. Um, but there's yeah, there's a simple milkiness to it. But every wheel, the acidity is a little bit different. Every it's just depends on the season and what the cows are grazing on. So it is kind of different from wheel to wheel. I'm gonna taste it with the Pinot Gris. <laughs> it's delicious with the Pinot Gris. 
So this, what yeah. by stony fruit? Uh, stone fruit is when this the fruit has the pit in it. So apples, pears oh, are all okay. stone fruits. All right. Yeah, yeah. peaches, all yeah. of that. Peaches, yeah. apricots, yeah. some, some to yeah. me. So yeah, whenever you hear see stone fruit, that's what they're referring to. Yeah. <laughs> good Thank question. you for asking. So you've, yeah, that's you've, a good question. You've got some dried <laughs> apricot on your yeah on your plate there. A little bit of that might amp amp it up, mm -hmm. and it should pair well with uh, with the cheese too. So and then this is a blend of three different vineyard sites. So it's their estate at Ravana, and then they also source from two other sites, and then. He has kind of like a the the are a winemaker. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm also gonna probably like lose it in here where the winemaker's name is, but I know that I put his name in this. Um, but the um, Brian Brian Weil. So Brian is the winemaker, and he's been with them since 2012. And so the basically what he does is they have a, they're in Dundee Hills, and so they're at a high elevation site, and so they they basically like they're on one side of the mountain and then they source from another side of the mountain and then they source from a valley. So from the Valley Vineyard. So they have a blend of these three different, um, they're all the same grape varietal, but they're different sites in this. And so that's why it's their terroir series is because they're kind of trying to show you like, this is what Dundee Hills tastes like, not just one site, that's but like nice. what Dundee Hills actually tastes like um, it like done well. And so their other side of the mountain, like that one is what they pick first. That one is kind of their leany, like leaner Pinot Gris style. He said that's the, like the most higher acidic, um, higher acidity, I should say. And then also has more of like the, the lemon curd and the citrus notes. Then this site, Ravana, which is their estate site, is more of that like rounder fruit fuller fruit picked, I think I want to say the last actually, and then the valley is picked second. So because it gets, it gets warmer. And then it's basically, it's the final blend because everything, he ferments everything separately. And then he comes up with how much he wants to put in, in what vessels and then to get that actual blend that he is really striving for. So the blend is 64% done in stainless steel tanks. 15% done in stainless steel drums, which are going to be smaller, and then 16% in neutral French oak barrels, which just means that they're aged, they're not brand new, and so you're not going to get that vanilla tone to it. And then 5% um, in the new French barrels. And French versus American oak is where you're going to have more of a brioche versus vanilla and baking spices, basically. But the French are going to have more of the, the baking the brioche, I should say, not the baking spices and the vanilla. Bread and butter. So, mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and yeah, so it's, I think it's a fantastic, like, it's just amazing. Oh, cool. Easy. It drinking. is. It is. Yeah. So. We like? Mm -hmm. Yay. Good. Awesome. So we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's probably got to do with the sites, you know, like that's probably like he wants to do the drums with the the, the one vineyard that's the leaner one. Or, you know, like I, that's a good question for the winemaker where I'm like, I have no idea, but I will ask that person. <laughs> exactly. When we get them, that's the, those are the kinds of questions that I love asking them. It's like, why? What's the difference? And I'm like, why do you do this this way? And I also like, racking for the longest time everybody kept on talking about racking and i finally was just like i don't mean to like embarrass myself but i should probably know this but i've never made wine myself so what is this and so then they explain the process and then i'm like ah okay i've seen that done actually and now i know what you're talking about it's when they actually take like they take the the wine and they just literally hook up a hose and they just move it from barrel to barrel but the sediment settles and it's a less you're not filtering it through a whole system, everything, and removing everything, and then filtering it out, which is going to basically kind of remove a lot of the the body of the wine mm -hmm. and a lot of the character of it. So a lot of winemakers are moving more towards a more of a minimal interventionist, which I call Minvin approach, which is doing less. So racking is more of a natural way of just filtering out the sediment and the parts that you don't necessarily want in your bottle. But sediment is natural. 
You know, like whenever you see sediment in a bottle, it just means that yeah, that's anyways. not, I do too. Yeah. It just means it's not been filtered. So, and you can decant it if you want, you know, <laughs> if you don't want to drink it, you don't have to, <laughs> you can leave it at the bottom of the bottle. <laughs> Something important I left out about this cheese. Ren rennet, you know, well, the, yeah. the rennet. Rennet is what triggers the separation of curds and whey. It usually comes from an uh, enzyme from the fourth stomach of an animal, a uh, ruminant animal. Let me finish this cheese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can also come from a lab, which a lot of them come from nowadays. You'll just see bacterial rennet. This comes from a thistle flower, the cardoon thistle, the pretty purple flower. Mm. Mostly that's done in Spain and Portugal where the thistle flower grows a lot. For whatever reason, the fion, uh, Fiondino is the family name that makes this. They use uh, a stamen, a little, part of, a little part of the flower, can be thrown into milk and trigger the separation of curds and whey. So that oh, is wow. uh, true, cool is that? A, a true vegetarian runner. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so that's it's really a, cool. something really unique. They, make, a, they make a Parmesan or a Grana style cheese. Uh, with this vegetarian rennet and um, yeah, it's just a unique thing for a producer to use. Uh, yeah, That's in, cool. in, in, yeah, it's a cardoon thistle, a wild cardoon yeah. thistle. I guess it's in the artichoke asparagus yeah. family. Yeah. So um, there's these very famous soft sheep's milk cheeses that are like little uh, little sandwiches or little pies, torta style cheeses, little cake style cheeses. Well, they're very semi-soft and you just kind of take the top off of them with a paring knife and the whole thing is almost already not not molten but very soft <laughs> and you can you can just dig veg crudite into it or yeah. bread into it but that's when the uh the kind of vegetal note of the thistle flower comes out um with the spanish and, and portuguese style ones really interesting cheeses yeah. oh how cool is that yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's all very poetic. Yes. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but whenever you see thistle or you think of an artichoke, you'll think, oh, but that's the yeah. stuff they put in the cheese. Yeah. It's pure. And then the, this is good. the, the name itself, I guess, the. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. Lou Berger Pichin. I didn't say. Yeah. The, 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 the man in the hut, the small man in the hut. They named the cheese after. Um, their grand, their grandfather, who all he did is want to hang out up in the mountains in the cheese making huts and kind of just just make cheese. And so it's a kind of a tribute to their grandfather um, with the name of the cheese. Yeah, I think I would do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the cows and eat some cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Drink wine. Yeah. Eat cheese. Yeah. And they have good chocolate over there too. So. All right, so now we're going to go to Washington and we're going to take it up a notch and we're going to drink some Chardonnay now. And this is definitely, in my opinion, your quintessential buttery mm -hmm. Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I personally, I, I'm not, I'm not a huge buttery Chardonnay fan, but I like this. I like the way that this one is done. It's very balanced, and so, and I, I think that it's a fantastic representation. And so that's why we brought this on. This is um, Hedges Family Estate, and so um, we met Christoph a couple weeks ago, and he came, and he's the son of the family, and his mom is French. His dad grew up in Washington. They met, I think, in France. And they had, um, they got married in 1976 and they traveled around the world for a while, um, had like uh, having an agricultural import business. And they really wanted to get into wine. Um, and when they moved back to Washington or finally settled, I guess, back with um, his dad's, you know, roots, they moved to uh, Red Mountain. And this was an area that's kind of desert like almost like it's pretty arid um it's not super uh like it's not like oregon is at all it's not green and lush um you can see from the picture like these this is the vines here that's the green part but behind that it's it's not really green <laughs> mm -hmm. you know like that's pretty pretty desert like so that's really what it is like so you're talking about like you always with vines, you want them to struggle and you always also want that diurnal shift. 
And so this is definitely an area where they get that. They get the cold nights, they get the hot days. They also get like the cool, the cool breeze that basically comes in and cools off the grapes and allows them to continue to develop that sugar that allows them to ripen. So, so are they mostly on the western part? Of they're Washington? eastern, actually. Eastern. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't get the Pacific cold. No, it's like they're in the desert part of Washington. Almost. Wow. Yeah. Almost like Nevada, and we're. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it is. It's very it's very rural and it's very agricultural, but it's a very like it's a different kind of agricultural. I mean, like Red Mountain is then. And in my opinion, like I've I've been a fan of Red Mountain wines, but I've been I'm glad that I'm starting to see more of them because every time I've tasted Red Mountain wines, I've always loved them. It's kind of like I really love Howell Mountain wines from Napa. There are certain like mountains that they just have really good, like they just produce really great fruit. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those like regions, in my opinion, that is kind of a, a sleeper region where like not very many people do know about it, but not very many people know about it. It's not quite hot, as hot as Napa yet, you know, like on the radar. So you can don't get, tell yeah, anyone. Exactly. So you can get good <laughs> deals. Like this is a $20 wine, you know? So, but you would not guess that by tasting it necessarily. Cause if this was in Napa, this would probably be a $40 wine mm -hmm. just because of the pedigree of the real estate there. So or the expense of the real estate, not the pedigree necessarily, but the expense. But the pedigree also, as far as like, this is what the earth has done. Like there is layers and layers and layers and layers of, of alluvial soils. Like there's a lot going on here. So, so yeah, so they started the winery in 1989. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, it's like very kind of like, it's very vanilla. It, Charlie earlier today, he was like, it's got like that coarse kind of like beer, you know? <laughs> it does, but it doesn't have that weird pungent. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's that nice and bright. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a nicer, brighter, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And there's also like a little bit of a savoriness to the finish of it as well. So this is aged. So they have 125 acres. They farm all biodynamically and organically. So biodynamic is just basically like when they also use like animals, you know, to basically like do the weeding and eat the bugs and they'll use other things like other different crops to basically to revitalize and replenish the earth when they pull stuff out of it. So, and they've been doing that since 2001. And they're not completely certified biodynamic, but they are working on that. Actually, back, they might be. No, they're not. Um, they're working towards, I think, getting fully biodynamic. But they they don't have everything completely. But they do farm organically. They're not organic certified um, for the same reasons that they're not biodynamically certified. It's expensive. It's terribly expensive. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And we can talk about that with chocolate, but yes. Yes. Yeah, so. Those that know me know my feeling about organic. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, basically, Sarah and Christoph, um, Sarah does kind of like the gardening aspect of it, and she's become um, their, I believe, like the winemaker, right? Yeah. Sarah is the winemaker, and Christoph is basically like the salesperson, and then he also helps with, not helps with, but like he designs the winery, and like he's into the architectural and the structural part of it, and then she's into the wine part of it. Yes. Uh, Jill, Jill B asks, does the C N E O? Yes. That's what I was just trying to figure out, like see on, on my notes, which I have. I gotta have my tech sheets here. It sees, let's see. No, 100% stainless steel fermentation to dryness at cool temperatures um, and then it says, uh, no, I take that back. One third of it does go through full malolactic fermentation and it is aged on oak. So that's probably why you do get the vanilla in there, but it's not a fully, fully oaked wine, which is why you've got the brightness in my opinion. But yeah, so this is Columbia, Yakima, and also um, the mountain. So. And yeah, 98, there is 1% of Sauvignon Blanc 
and 1% of Marsan also in this. Mm -hmm. And that's probably on there, again, just to like boost up that acidity. So, and that's what they said, like aging for optimum fruit flavors and aromas, drink now, but the higher acid in this wine should keep it drinking well for several more years. And I agree, I feel like that you could lay this wine down and it will still, it will just continue to be good. And you don't need to worry about it. It's got a Svelven top or screw cap. So it can also like, it's pretty easy to just throw in the bag and take with you wherever you mm -hmm. want to go. Mm -hmm. Pop it open whenever you want. So let's talk about this cheese that cheese, we're yeah, about yeah. to um, enjoy. Green light cheese or soft ripened cheese. Uh, so penicillium candidum is the beneficial uh, mold on the rind, totally edible. Those that dig around it, you know, they, sure, that's okay. But in general, it's totally edible. has a simple white mushroom flavor. Um, it's from uh, Marin County near Petaluma in Northern California, hour outside of San Francisco. The oldest uh, ongoing creamery in the nation. Uh, before I did research to get that little bullet point, Jess told me that. And I was dubious because I, you know. Surely in New York or somewhere on the East Coast, it's got to be the oldest creamery in the nation. It's be and the yes, East Coast. The, old, the, old, the oldest ones were started on the uh, on the East Coast, but now defunct or, you know, not. So this is the longest ongoing creamery in the nation. Award winning uh, double cream breeze, triple cream breeze. They have this. They have another uh, pep, um, chili flavored one. Um, Regular brie is what, milk in general is about 50% butter fat to 55. Add, add enough heavy cream to a cow's milk, cow's milk cheese to make it a double cream to get it from 60 to 75% mm -hmm. butter fat. So this is a, a double cream brie. When you get 75% or above, it's triple cream. So cow's milk, cows that they do not have on their farm. So when you, when you get milk from another farm that's when it's considered you're considered an artisan cheese maker if, it, if you're making cheese with from cows that are on your own farm that's a farmstead cheese to me one step better you have you have you know where, where everyone's eating what they're eating um, but they uh the north bay creameries they get their their milk from so all local local dairies and uh, and where is this this is marin county petaluma famous town okay. where Cowgirl Creamery is a uh, cheesemaker, award-winning cheesemaker, and uh, Cheesemongers, a cheese mong a company that I worked for in, in the D.C. area for a little while. Um, but yeah, so an hour outside, hour outside out of out of San Francisco. Nice. Yeah, I didn't know exactly how far. I googled it tonight. It was uh, an hour's drive, thirty-nine miles. Where, where in San Francisco they were determining that from, I don't know, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> city center. Um, but yeah, not far, but you can see some pictures of the uh, hmm. video of the area, gorgeous area, and uh, in a mecca of farm to table cooking and yeah. savvy animal husbandry practices where they're allowing cows to be on pasture. Um, anyway, so the little, little bit of truffle, truffle in this breed, kind of, Old earthy flavor, yeah. yeah, goes a long way. Great to cook with, but great, to, great on its Have you tried it with a little bit of honey on it yet? I did not. I can't one. It's not my favorite, and I'm sure it's amazing. I just don't. Yeah. Have it. I don't have the, the fanciest palate. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I'm not a big a sweet eater. Palette. So we, when we I saw her put honey, was like, plate. I'm just not like the. You don't like the truffle. Or, I do, but I and yeah. I know it's really really good. So I love. <laughs> I appreciate everything you're saying. Right. <laughs> It's, it's more of my truffles in the um, in the yeah. mushroom family, right? Mm -hmm. The very high, you know, very high price per per, per ounce. Historically, do you know, dogs or pigs run around in the woods certain time of the year. Find them in oak in oak flats in north in northwest of Italy in the southwest of France. Um, but there's well, there's a Georgia Georgia producer trying to make truffles happen. I haven't kept up on this. Yeah. But I know there's there's or there's you know yeah. a lot of foraging done in, in Oregon. I think there's Oregon produce, but you know Europeans might, and I'm sure poo poo what the Americans are doing. Well, they recreate, did that with wine. Recreate the environment. Years ago. Um, yeah. Anyway, so um, beautiful cheese, great family to support. Uh, California cheesemaker that 
It's really been nice. in business a long time. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, one more little pairing for me. Here, take it, Stacey. Yeah, so I we did it. We add the honey to if you want to add the honey to it. It does kind of brighten it up with the chardonnay. That's kind I of where it fits in. To the last cheese. And yeah. The can of chardonnay. Yeah. Can of bread. <laughs> Mm. It's delicious, yeah. <laughs> Honey's Good. always an easy brightener, I always feel like. <laughs> I'm just, but the last cheese, the first cheese with the second wine, and she liked it. I believe it. I feel like both of these cheeses would go with both of these wines, mm -hmm. personally. The truffle maybe might be too, like it might be a little bit too strong with a Pinot Gris, like you might lose some of the fruit in it. Mm. I think it will still be all right. You know, like it would, it wouldn't be like bad necessarily, but it just would. You wouldn't get the fruit as much. I think. I think this would over. That's what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. A plus and minus. Yeah, that's what we always talk about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I worked for um, a sommelier turned fromager. Ten, fifteen year old story. He was one of the first first Americans to be inducted in the Maitre Fromager Society of France. So. Master, master cheesemonger, maitre fromager. Um, but he, he had a pairing scale that uh, makes sense, I think, in a lot of pairings. Uh, it starts at starts at, at zero and either goes negative one, negative two, or positive one, positive two. You can find it in a lot of neutral pairings, but when you find that aha pairing, that's the ma or that yeah, major they aha pop pairing. Each other, when and you, they both pop. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Like Port and, and Stilton or Sauterne and Roquefort. Mm -hmm. Roquefort, the famous uh, cheese from France. So, so I'll turn the famous dessert wine when you have salty, intense, peppery flavors with a, a, a nice acidic yet sweet, yet sweet wine. That's when your mouth just kind of flips out. And you, um, that's when you get that positive too. Our, our goal and, you know, is always to find that positive too. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes you just, you find that neutral one where everyone's palate is a little bit different. You know, a truffle cheese in a red wine is, is easy to do and the more common thing to do. But we wanted to go a Which little out, outside yeah. of the box and try, uh, you know, she knew the flavor profile of this Chardonnay real well. So, um, like she mentioned that she liked the, the first cheese with the second one. I'd try that. I, I, and then well, you did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why it's fun to can, do the, the pairings and to see and experiment. You can take a little eat. If you have some of the Lou Bergier left and have some of the rind on the Lou Bergier with the second wine, that might be mm. one of those things that works. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, in, th in theory, that. that rind of that is going to be a hint truffle a hint mushroomy, which is, you know, a more tame version of the truffle yeah. infusion. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. As we do that. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Any other questions about this one, or do we want to move on to the reds? We kind of power through these. I don't mean to like. If if you guys need me to us to slow down, let me know. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yay! So now we're gonna go to uh, South America, and we're gonna go to Argentina. No and dark chocolate. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, From cheese speak to chocolate speak. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, and not to say chocolate doesn't go with cheese because certain chocolate does go with certain cheeses and they don't have to be, they don't have to be sweet cheeses. So we can do that blue, some other blue time. Blue cheese and chocolate, I've had, uh, I've sold, uh, there's a premier Italian affineur, someone who ages, all right, that's the French term for it. But they we we bought um, chocolate covered gorgonzola Ooh, sorry. truffles to to sell around Christmas or around Valentine's Day. Historically, knowing there's are classically with pairings pairing flavors, um, you get chocolate notes in certain in certain blue cheeses. Actually, a culinary school that I that I went to in New York City in '04, they got together with IBM and the Watson computer. And they analyze nearly every, every food, every food on the planet to break down all its uh, flavor profiles. And there's certain certain compounds in both cheese, blue cheese in particular, and chocolate that share. So that's 
you know, where people were just figure, figuring it out in their mind. These things, you know, I taste the, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 yeah, and then the, com the computer breaks it down and says, yeah, these do chocolate and cheese. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's not just a contrast, but there's also a marriage too. Well, chocolate has between five and 700 compounds involved yeah. in it. Just okay. a few. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. It's going to taste yeah. like many things. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. And that's why you, that's why you can't, you can't, you can't right. make artificial chocolate table. <laughs> because chocolate in itself is so complex between five and 700 different components to it to mm -hmm. make it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just phenomenal. And different parts of the, the chocolate pod or the plant itself is phenomenal in itself. So mm. I'm surprised you didn't bring your chocolate, like the cocoa <laughs> pods. I was expecting, oh, like, I, I mean, if, if you, I know Jill and Chad have seen the cocoa pods. They were Visual displays in the today, fact. So in like the they've past. seen them, but I was telling Char Charlie, I was like, oh no, Maggie usually brings her props and everything. <laughs> I know. And I normally She's do. got her chocolate pods or the cocoa pods, the cacao. 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 Pods. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, but we were in a smaller space and I didn't want are. to take up the whole yeah. table and Oh, that's okay. But we'll do that. We'll do that another time. And when I start talking about chocolate, I need Jessica to kick me in the shin and say, enough. <laughs> no such thing. I think we all that's kind of like why we are all here. <laughs> yeah. We like to talk about our favorite subjects. But we also enjoy yeah, yeah. It. we enjoy it. We're passionate about it. We do. All so our, let's talk about the products. wine. So yes. yeah, so I got to meet um, Santiago. Um, he came here a couple of months ago, actually. And the first question I, I of course, asked him was, when are you moving to St. Pete? <laughs> um, because St. Pete's awesome. But he uh, he he said, oh, well, we do love it. <laughs> He's got to talk to his wife about that first. So <laughs> because his wife is an architect and she designed their winery and cellar in Mendoza and they're in the Uco Valley and they're high, high, high up. They actually have a helicopter landing pad on their property because they're that high up that like, why, why, why not? <laughs> wow. You know, so, but they have, um, I want to say 64 acres, but Mendoza alone has, um, let me see here. Mendoza, I want to say it was like 300 or no, it was like 300,000 acres or something like that, which, so just to put it in perspective, like how small their property is versus like this entire wine region, you know, like they're in a special spot. Um, the Uco Valley is, and you can see this in the picture. Like this is, this is them in the summertime, which is their winter in our, um, our summer. But this is like this is the Andes, you know. So like this is what the vines look like during during their coldest time of the year. And again, like the vines are struggling. That's what you want to see, um, and that's what that's what you want. So he really farms like as minimally again as possible, organic, biodynamic. They're not certified the same as hedges is. Um, and they just do basically like the best that they can with the, with the land. Um, and so this is done. This receives a 15 day fermentation. Um, also with a maceration with daily delistage and rack and return procedures. It is aged in French oak barrels for 20 months. That's the racking you were talking yeah. about exactly. early. Yeah, because he doesn't fin he doesn't filter or fine. So that's why I like this is kind of like in my opinion, like it was just something that I started hearing a, a lot more of this term, like racking versus filtering and fining. And it just be it just is it a new terminology or is it something that they've been doing forever and we just didn't know about it? Exactly. Because they were filtering and fining so much in, in California, like that was kind of like the major, like the modern practices of winemaking with the U.S. So that okay. was kind of like how we did things that, you know, and so now we're kind of getting back to a traditionalist old, older winemaking techniques. And so our, a lot of our younger generational like winemakers are traveling and they're going to older countries and they're learning these older techniques in old countries. 
And so then they're bringing where it, it all back. began. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then they're bringing these these practices back to the U.S. and saying like, well, why can't we do that here? And so they just started doing it and seeing like what would happen. And their wines are delicious. So, but for a long time, it was like this question mark of, well, what's the ageability on that if you don't do that? You know, and also like, what is the consumer going to feel if they've got chunks on the bottom of their glass? Like, because people were returning the wine in restaurants. Like that's kind of like the, the, there's something yucky in there. Yeah, exactly. There's a bug in my drink, you know, like the, these are things that happen, you know? And so like in wine, that's one of those things that happen. So that's why the U S was in California in particular, they were filtering and they were finding, they wanted a clear, pristine wine, you know, but now we're not doing that as much. So that's why I was like, why is everyone talking about that? <laughs> okay. So I do like millennials now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to change your mind. They do have. <laughs> yes, they do. I love millennials. I do too, but. I love them all. I love everyone. Though. I just had to put that out there. <laughs> so, yeah. So, this is actually Finca La, Finca La Escarcha is, um, is their winery name. And this Entre, Entre, Entre Linares is in between the lines. So this is their terroir series, kind of like how the first one, that's their terroir series of Dundee. This is their terroir series, but like of his specific vineyard sites. Um, and so it's all 100% Syrah. There's nothing else blended into it. Whereas his other wines, like the Uncubierto and some of his other Pinto Escarcha wines, are blended from either like different lots or different, like there's a little bit of something else in there, maybe, you know, like mm -hmm. that's their entry level. Whereas this is like their, their, their topper tier, I guess I would say. So like this, this one retails for like under 35, but like 33.99 versus the Incubierto line that they offer, which is their entry level line is for like 19.99 retail. So, well, I haven't but tasted down, but this is very nice and bountiful. So it, is that a correct mm -hmm. description for and a wine, was, a bountiful wine? Yeah. Multi -layer. That's what Syrah is. Yeah. Multi -layer. Like, Syrah yeah. gives you spades and flavor and complexity. You could have that with lamb. Yes. That would work nicely with a nice mm -hmm. lamb. I love that you guys have like all different price points and, um, and you like describe it so well. Like, as opposed to going to ABC, which I also like. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just delightful to come into your shop. And, um, Thank you. Yeah, like how nice. you describe something. I'm like, I don't know everything about wine. Mm -hmm. It's like the more I hear, the more I learn. Yeah. The more you learn. Yeah. And yeah. I, I know like 10%, you know, whatever, 5%. So, but in a couple of years, you'll be like at 50, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and yeah. then you just keep going. It's, to to it's addictive. Talk about cheese and wine and chocolate. And, like, it's very, very nice. Yeah. Good. I'm we glad have, you joined us. Thank we have you. To crack this chocolate. Yes. Oh, That's yes. A big part of it. Yes. Yes. I, know, I see the guests eating chocolate and drinking wine. Like, I, 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 Wait a minute. Well, I, I, I know she wants to get to because the, the crack. Because you got to do the crack. The crack, the crack is an important part we, of it. We so cracked your story. I, I actually, but... Yeah, I cracked it in half. So, so for each of you to go ahead and talk about the crack. <laughs> well, here, this is being broken. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. we chose we chose to do a I put together a specific blend of origins for must wine loft. Mm -hmm. I did this so that the chocolate would work with most of her wines. Uh, this blend that I put together, it's a 74%, and I put together a Peruvian, which is your Alps and Peruvian is one of your oldest national chocolates. Um, and Ghana, which about 72% of the chocolate sold in the world comes from the Ivory Coast of Africa, which is part Ghana's part of. And then Nicaragua, which is in the South America, um, part of the Mesoamerica belt. Um, and so your Nicaragua is your very earthy and grounded where a lot of tobacco is grown for cigars. The inner part of the cigar, a lot of um, tobacco is 
grown in Nicaragua for those cigars. And the Peruvian is the Peruvian chocolate has your floral and um, fruitier notes. Because chocolate is a lot like wine in that each grape and each terroir has its own flavor profile. And chocolate, chocolate is very much like that. You don't have to add flavorings to chocolate if you pick the right origin. You can pick a Peruvian and even a 76 or 78% Peruvian, you'll think, oh my God, this is sweet. It's not sweet. It's just yeah. fruity and yeah. it's floral. Yeah. And like, that's all like natural. Beans. You can get those. Beans. Yes. 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 Like sometimes I'll read like coffee labels and they're like, great, peanut butter. And it's like, what? <laughs> right. But then you're like, oh. yeah. And it's the roasting oh, and, and we heard the snap and I didn't put it up to my thing, but. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> but we heard the snap. I I yes. I the snap. Yes. Well, the it's, snap means that it is cocoa butter and it's not full of hydrogenated fats. And oh. my chocolates basically are three ingredients. It's the cocoa, cocoa butter, which is in the same pod, by the way, mm -hmm. and sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. Some of my chocolate does have some sunflower lecithin, and that's just to bind it because of, um, for production. But most of my chocolates from my single origin are just three ingredients. You said this is 72. Does that mean it's 18% sugar or how much of cocoa butter? Is that what that number means? I know, that I know in general that, it's always more bitter. But the, the, the higher the percentage, the more bitter it is. Well, you only get bitter because it was roasted incorrectly. Hmm. Well, yeah, the bitterness versus... The, the bitterness comes from the, the cocoa beans weren't roasted properly, similar to coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. wrongly Burn. roast, if yeah. you roast coffee beans at too high of a temperature or too low of a temperature, right. then you're going to get, and you don't, you don't buy good beans, coffee beans, mm -hmm. you're going to get a bitter coffee. Right. If you buy a quality origin chocolate, I mean, it, and coffee, they're roasted properly and then it's not going to be bitter. I can give you a 100%, which I have mm -hmm. for you. <coughs> Excuse me. And they were blown away because it's not that bitter. Oh, right. it's this. Wow. This is kind of fruity and not yeah, because it was roasted properly. So that's where the bad roasting. And we were talking earlier about America and how wine is filtered and that sort of thing and not right. racking. Right. Yeah. Um, part of our memory is from taste. Part of our tasting is memory. I said that backwards. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in America, we were born and grew up on Nestle's and Hershey's chocolates, which they brought in and processed so that it was in large quantities and they did things to it, it made it sweeter. So in America, we're so used to eating chocolate that's so sweet, we have become so familiar with that, that's what we expect from chocolate. We expect it to taste exactly the same all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm hoping that we can change, change that, that like yeah. they, like we do with wine, like yeah. she does with wine and try to educate people as to- Well, it's living. It's a living product, yes. in my opinion. So that's yeah, this is delicious. I don't think I'm deprived of anything. Right? <laughs> I feel like it's like, oh, I'm missing some wax. Missing, you know, some <laughs> Thank you. There is no, no. And you can yeah. drink water after you eat my chocolate yeah. and you won't get that waxy feeling exactly. in your mouth. And, or the grittiness. And it's very, very that. healthy. Yeah. Like, seriously healthy. Antioxidants and all kinds of good stuff. Any questions? I just wish I had more. <laughs> Learn something new every day, right? <laughs> There's 42 steps. Right? I know it is. Yes. 42 steps to make to get it from the from the tree from the to tree. you to us wow. eating it. 42 steps. Wow. Right? Thank you. Yeah. We, we love all the yes. Great guilty pleasure. Oh, well, yeah. All three of the things were. Actually, 
if you eat good chocolate, there's nothing you feel guilty, nothing guilty about. Nothing guilty. Nothing you feel guilty about. No, no because it's not it, a lot of sugar. Yeah. It's not a lot of sugar. Right, right. And it's pure cane sugar, if anything. But it's it, it the endorphins and what it does. If you're feeling depressed and you eat a good chocolate, it helps you feel better. It helps to raise your endorphins and yeah. Like I said, there's Everybody between. Has a caffeine, right? So if you're not a that, because chocolate tends to keep me awake. Certain has certain amount of caffeine, yes, but not a tremendous amount. This, I think, I read that the amount of caffeine in chocolate it's like is. A cup of tea, I think is what I read, or like yeah. less, a little less than a cup of tea. It's like so black minute, tea, like Earl Grey, basically. It's the maybe sugar. It's the, maybe it's the endorphin, or yeah, or the sugar. It's the sugar. Or the endorphin release that you got. That you're eating will give you that fast. It depends on the percentage. So, so this one here, what is this, 74? So there's what, 32? No, where's my math? 26. 26, yeah. 26%. And that's for a large amount, so. It's fine. So new. that's what that percentage means. It's the cocoa, the cacao versus the sugar. Correct. When you see that on a chocolate bar. Well, yes. For the majority of the part, yes. Yeah. I mean, some add vanilla and some add other things to it. Right. But when my chocolate is just the but three they don't ingredients. Even the percentage. It's what I notice usually when they blend other things into it. I know. You know, because know. it's probably so lost. In America, <laughs> you can get away with. Yeah. But the, yeah. Yeah. So this is um, on the back of their, their label. It's, they're very, um, they're very technical um, with this line and they really just make a thousand, I want to say it's like a thousand, a little over a thousand bottles that they produce of this particular one. So his, his notes are basically Coseca, which is like how it's produced. It's manual. And it was put into the into the barrel, basically a 15 kilogram barrel um, on March 30th of 2016. Um, it then was aged for 16 months in in barrel old barrels, and it's 100% Syrah. And then it was put into the bottle in August 17 of 2017. This is bottle number 1,332. Wow. So, um, yes, exactly. I really appreciate like labels like this. Yes. And also winemakers and, like, this is artisan, in my opinion. Like, when you care that much, you, you know every bottle and everything, like, that to me is like, thank you. Thank you. There's a cheddar <laughs> producer in, so, the, in southern England, Larry When Quick. he comes back in town, we're definitely going to be doing a, a wine dinner with him when he's back in town because just lovely and just very passionate. His background was he was in the wine industry and then just decided, like, he was just so passionate about wine from being in the wine industry. He was actually an importer. And so he was on more of the, the sales and negotiations side, not as a winemaker whatsoever. And then just kind of like got into it just because he loves it so much. And from hanging out with these winemakers and everything and going to the wineries, decided like, well, I'm going to try my hand at it and let's start like super small batch. So that's what he started out doing and just loved it. Like, it's kind of one of those things like once you're hooked, you're hooked. <laughs> well, it's kind of how I, I, you know, I started in chocolate in the opposite way. I started chocolate and making chocolate because I couldn't find a chocolate that I really liked and I, I like dark chocolate because I don't like sweets, yeah. believe it or not, I don't like sweets. Yeah. And mm -hmm. now I'm at this point where I have farmers from all over the world contacting me to get their product out. Like there's, um, I'm expecting some beans from this farm in Belize so Hershey's used to have um, a Hershey's cocoa amusement kind of a thing in Belize. <laughs> and this farmer that I'm working with, when I say farmer, I mean 
communities right. because like the cooperative like yeah, what we're about they're, yeah. They're, yeah yeah to talk about with this next line yeah yeah they yeah. they all work it's together the villages village. yeah. and it's yeah. the whole village yeah this is their pro their product their, and their upbringing their for industry. centuries yeah. yes it's not just yeah their livelihood their livelihood their craft. And yeah forever so i'm excited to get these beans well anyways hershey's abandoned this this amusement park and these farmers bought the Hershey's. So their harvest in Belize for cocoa is in December. So they're ready to ship the end of this month. I'll be getting fun. some brand new beans from, mm -hmm. I know, Belize, it'll be Yay. fun. <laughs> yeah, it'll be so exciting. Coming soon. <laughs> coming soon, yes, coming soon. That's awesome. Yeah. Have you had cocoa? Uh, probably like Not from Belize yeah. yet. Okay. Not from Belize yet. Okay. Yeah. So we'll see like how that compares then to to the other yeah to bars. Peruvian yeah. and yeah. yeah because it's kind of in that that so same longitude latitude yeah latitude, latitude. yeah because if you look at a map which is yeah, interesting because we've talked yeah. about this you have the equator yeah and twenty degrees north and south yeah. of the equator is where chocolate grows cocoa yeah. oh, yeah. cacao grows. Right? At 20 degrees north and south of the equator, period. That's where it grows. Mm -hmm. Anything above the 20 and below the 20 is where your yeah, wines come. It's 40s, yeah. 40s are the wine, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yep. Yeah. It's fun. All right. We're gonna Moving move, to dessert. Right? We're going to move to By dessert. The sweet. Yeah. So, one of the things finish. that I, I want to just it's food wise. quickly touch on is a pairing note just as a rule of thumb if you i don't even like to say a rule of thumb but it, i'll use it as a, a pairing hack basically you pair cheese and wine opposite of how you pair cheese and, or wine and chocolate as far as like the lineup goes so like with cheeses you want to start out with like the mildest cheese and go get funkier oh. and so you're going to do the same thing with your wines like your wine profile, you're gonna want that to like, com like either contrast or um, or complement that pairing. So you're gonna go like that with cheese and wine. However, when you get into chocolate, you want to start off with your bitterest chocolate, and then you move into the sweeter chocolates. So that flip flops on wine entirely because then you're gonna wanna start off with like your boldest wine and your biggest wine, and then you're gonna wanna get lighter and fruitier to go with the sweeter chocolates exactly so it's kind of interesting in that it's like a mirror yeah it's like a mirror on each other yeah <laughs> so we're gonna go flip-flop and now we're gonna go to italy and so we're gonna go old world we were in new world and now we're gonna go old world which you don't normally want to do but we're doing it because we're gonna go to milk chocolate with our next one as well and so this is primitivo from Puglia, and Puglia is in the boots of Italy, so at the heel, basically. And this is, Oops. Hope I, hope, hopefully I didn't get you uh, a, on the, on the a, jeans. These are my work shoes. <laughs> and uh, Primitivo is Zibindel's cousin, basically. So, yes, it's delicious. And this is the Tanazzi family. And they started in, I want to say, 1968. And originally it was um, Jean Andrea and Tanazzi and uh, his dad. And he was 18 when they started. And there was one article that I read. And it was just so, so adorable because I totally understand, like, when you're starting a, a business, a new business, and fun things happen and fun things like COVID happen <laughs> and oh stuff gets thrown at you. You got to get creative. Not only do you have to get creative, you also just have to keep going. Um, and you have to have a certain level of tenacity to you. And that's what I like about these guys is they didn't give up. They just kind of kept going. And there was an article where I was reading and he was like, he was like, well, you know, like there was a point in time where we were so broke, we were literally considering like just selling the chairs, yeah. you know, like out of the winery, out of the tasting room, because like we didn't know how we were going to pay our bills, but we just knew like we had to keep going. And now it's kind of crazy because like all of, all of that, 
like keep going and that doggedness almost like it pays off as long as you do keep mm -hmm. going and so now they own like multiple estates and they started out in Verona, which is in like the Veneto, like north northeastern Italy, basically. And so they started out there and they have like, I want to say three or four properties now up there. And then they also bought two properties in Puglia. So they are now going like very different. And so it's kind of like Mediterranean wines and then very like north, north northern Italy. So very contrast of profiles and flavors as well. This to me is definitely like, warm climate like mediterranean it's bright red fruit um and i haven't tasted it with the milk chocolate yet so this is going to be kind of a blind pairing for me all three of us yeah all pairing. three of us but i i have a feeling because i have tasted this wine and i know this wine and i have tasted the chocolate just not together until now and i think it's going to be delicious just based off of remembering both of them right so i just got a crazy cherry note it is got crazy cherry notes. Crazy cherry notes. Yeah, Maras what, what, Maraska what, cherry. Like, only, so I, the wine. A lot of times definitely. in a pairing, you want to have both in your mouth at yeah. the same time. Then you want to just eat some cheese, mm -hmm. see how the wine has changed the flavor of the cheese. Then go back to the wine and see how the cheese that was maybe still lingering in your mouth has changed the wine. Mm -hmm. That's the same exactly with chocolate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amaretto almost, which is like the hyper almond flavor, right? Uh, more of is that nice? Mm -hmm. Italian, I haven't tasted it with the Oh, you have it? Yeah, I'm about to do that. Okay. <laughs> so I haven't had a sweet chocolate, a milk chocolate in forever. <laughs> I went to culinary school 20 years ago. And, you know, you, I'm working with all these Europeans and, you know, they you go out to eat or you go shopping together and they're like, you guys and your stupid milk chocolate. Like, you know, this is the kind I of know. chocolate you eat. You're like, oh. So it you know, evolved my taste, and mm -hmm. um, I have now stuck nice. with dark chocolate. My kids want nothing it's to like do with, with any milk chocolate. They, it, all they know is dark yeah. chocolate. Their mom is uh, a pastry chef. You know, she loves her her uh, her dark chocolates, and the kids have they eat bitter things that a lot of people don't uh, wouldn't believe that they eat. But anyways, t tasting this milk chocolate for the first time, it was like a Slice transported of, yes <laughs> slice of nostalgia back 20 you know 25 years before well this is a, a milk chocolate that i get from felklin out of switzerland um and it's a 38 percent milk chocolate okay. and felklin has a trademark actually on how they pasteurize and dehydrate their milk because in switzerland they have happy cows mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're getting beautiful Swiss milk from happy cows. Mm. And that's what your difference is. That's what from the most creamy. pristine that's what makes on it the planet. Creamy. That's what makes it. You know, they drink, you go yeah. hiking in, in Switzerland, you drink right out of a community fountain. You know, the that's right. Pristine air, pristine water, pristine soil, amazing cheeses from from the Swiss Alps. It's no wonder that exactly. their milk chocolate is And that's is why the milk too. chocolate is, it's got that mm -hmm. caramely kind it of does. undertone to it because of the way it's roasted it's properly. Silky. And yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, I've been doing obviously a lot of studying. and I have found that there's one component that is such the simplest little thing, but in each country, it changes it changes the, the flavor profile or flavor pro profile tasting of each product in other words water yeah water water the simplest thing yeah. but in italy the water tastes different in yeah. switzerland the water tastes different in new york mm -hmm. what is yeah. new york famous or for for its bagels yeah. because of the water right, right. So water is the basic of all ingredients, but it can be so different tasting and, and change the flavor of everything. It changes wine and beer also. Yeah. I've heard there are water sommeliers. Yes, there are. Yes, so there are. At least I have heard that. <laughs> right? Yes, it's a new thing. I want to go to that class the next. Neutral, <laughs> neutral, the neutral palate. <laughs> <laughs> I just read a guy's recipe yep. uh, 
and they were using mustards in all these recipes. And this one particular chef was a, a mustard sommelier. Oh, I love mm. mustard. <laughs> I would love to be a couple of mustard sommelier. I will <laughs> totally. Yeah, or, to, or to like have a chat with her. Right. <laughs> I will be your apprentice. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, yeah. Maya is a very famous uh, mustard producer. They certify people as mustard Wait, Some mustards are more, you know, like uh, vinegary. Right. Yeah. Like, some are greener, like, right, right. It's just you know, it's just like everything. There's a museum for there's a museum That's for what's mustard. What's so fun about them? <laughs> really? Our my old landlord of business I used to work at. He he was approached by the owner of a mustard museum uh, in Minnesota or Wisconsin because he wanted to move it down south and he knew Jonathan was this real estate tycoon and hey why don't you okay, how, how can we get the mustard museum down here i'm like oh, i'll help run it <laughs> i don't know a lot but i can taste a lot of stuff oh, we'll get it figured out <laughs> yeah yeah your flavor right right all three yeah <laughs> i love mustard i have a there whole shelf <laughs> a whole shelf half of a shelf dedicated just to mustard in my fridge so yeah <laughs> It is a lot of mustard. Oh, no. <laughs> I have to stir the mustard sometimes. <laughs> but it's worth it. Oh, that's it. a visual. I know. It's worth it. <laughs> no, I just shake them up. <laughs> but when I do brush it, I do stir them up. But that's kind of the way that it is. So this is um, the, the grapes are crushed and they stemmed, and then they are macerated and fermented at very cold. It's it basically sees a cold fermentation for 10 days and then it gets pressed again and then put into oak barrels, neutral oak barrels for four to six months. And that's it. It's pretty much, it's a very simple wine. Um, Primitivo is, this area is like just every day, this is what is the most planted in this area. Puglia is in the heel of the boot of Italy. So they have the, they have the Ionian Sea to the west of them. And then they have the Adriatic Sea to the east, and they are closest to Greece. So they have like architecturally and also food and uh, like influences, just cultural influences are the more Greek actually than Italian. So, which is mm. interesting. So, and then there they plant mostly in this area, like hotter red varietals, not as many whites. It's kind of like almost two reds to one white, basically. So, and Primitivo is the main one and it's mostly like all local or indigenous grape varietals. So Negro Amaro, um, and then you get into like a bunch of other ones, Nero, Nero de Troya. There was like another fun one that I was like, oh, I've never heard of that. And I was like, who's this? <laughs> <laughs> I was like repeating after him. Like, it's just one of those like, Fun to say, like somebody like, boo, you should do it in the pub. Yeah. <laughs> just like, oh, this is so fun to say. Is it exactly Zinfandel? Is it Italy's name for Zinfandel? It is the or cousin of cousin. Zinfandel. I have, so I've, basically, I've when they tell do, me, oh no, that's just the same name for Zinfandel, but it's not. It's not. It's not. They're a cousin of. Okay. They're not the same exact grape. It is similar profile. It's, though. Yeah, it's literally like you know, like you are your. Your dad's right, child. right, right. I got you. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't. I, 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 quest, I questioned, but I never looked up. Yeah. You know, is it exa is so it just, just what they basically linked Zinfandel to the in Italian is Primitivo. Yeah. Primitivo yeah. is America's Zinfandel cousin. Yeah, cousin. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, but I, I personally feel that Primitivo for me is is fruitier um, in the the states. I feel like we kind of. We make Zinfandel more like Syrah a lot of the times. You don't see that many lighter style Zinfandels. They're usually done kind of weighty and they're usually oaked. Like and the Lodi's are very... The Lodi's are, are jimmy and, and weighty. And okay. like you, you can okay. feel them, you can feel the tannins, like all of it. Okay. So in my opinion, so it, it just, that's, it's more tannin structure. They okay. Have, they have kind of like that, that like struggle going on there it's well, hot it's funny that well i'm hot. just i can only so associate what i know and i know lodi yeah. zins are, are famous so lodi this is, famous is for their zins, this but. is different climate because in lodi they're like in the desert mm -hmm. they're not near the water whatsoever right whereas here 
they get cooled off by the water, by the by the wind. Mm. They're okay. more Mediterranean climate, so the skin's not in my. I don't know because again, I didn't. I I'm not an enologist, so I'm I'm not. I don't know. This is just my my theory in my head that the skins probably develop a thinner skin in Puglia versus in Lodi because oh, yes. they have to, like they have yes. to protect themselves, you know? So I feel like the tannins are stronger in a Lodi Zinfandel versus a Puglio Primitivo. Right. Like to me, this is like the easier drinking, you know, like this is an easy summer time. Absolutely. Bed. Absolutely. Like, with barbecue. Yes. 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 All day long. Yes. So it's a nice shrimp. Yeah. Where, whereas like a low dye I'm like, oh god. That's a steak like, and that's a that's a heavy meal. Right. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So that'd be the, the, the difference if that makes sense to explain. It that. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well there's also a Paris, Texas. <laughs> oh no. So. Lodi, California. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, no. There's also a Paris. <laughs> there's also a Paris, Maine. There you go. See. <laughs> this was my aha pairing. This was my plus one, if not plus two pairing, which was something we did blind. But there's something. Yeah, I like the combination. I, I don't know. I feel it. Like, I feel like somehow cherry was evoked out of the chocolate, not out of the wine. I don't know. But I, to me, that was a <laughs> it was really the, aha. The fruit, yeah, the, fruit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the fruit and the fruit work. Yes. So that was the plus plus that we're right. looking for. Mm -hmm. I and we like had talked about that once. Yeah, the plus plus. When Jessica had mentioned, I want to do chocolate and I'm, I want to do this Zin, not a Zin, but. The Primitivo, yeah. Primitivo, yes. Yeah. And it has a fruity kind of strawberry notes to it. Like red fruit. Yeah. Red fruits. And I thought, ooh, then I would like to do my Swiss milk which has a caramel undertone, yeah. which helps that strawberry and that, that fruity fruit. pop. Mm -hmm. And so that's why. Definitely did. Yeah. yeah. It was a beautiful combination. Yeah. And you that guys like it. Third job the fourth one. And how is it? That could, yeah, good too. Should really? Be, should be in yeah. theory. I think so too. I think that they would all work. And that, that's another thing I was going to say is also like, I like to leave a little bit, like as you can see on my plate, so I can yeah. keep on trying yes. everything with to, everything to, because that's kind of the fun of it. Yeah. We <laughs> <laughs> love it. Excellent. It's your first time. Now you're not, now you're back. <laughs> Isn't it fun doing these? And I'm glad you joined us because it's. For, I don't know about my panel here, but it's right, so yeah, nice yeah. to have somebody to talk with. We, we prefer the conversation than <laughs> having this light in our face. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And I love it. This is great. Good. Like, if it was just us, I've been working for Right. Okay. Look at your name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Through this, like through food and wine, literally. That's how we've all met. In, From what? Through food and wine. She came like, into the, a restaurant I used to work, work at, and we connected right away talking. I know I've worked in specialty at Whole Foods yeah. where you, it's, it's, it's the uh, beer, wine, cheese, yeah. and coffee, tea, and chocolate, fun department to work in. So I love chocolate, and I love her passion for chocolate, and she could tell and I, I have a passion for cheese. And Jess, I met a long time ago when she was doing a pop-up restaurant, or maybe even Gator just having beers yeah. at Ale and Witch a decade ago <laughs> when we all went to Ale and you know, It was our, everyone's favorite beer bar in town before we had a brewery. Yeah, and I used to bring cheeses to Ale and Witch. I was new to town. I would I, leave the Mazzaro's, and I would come there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it all has to be really good going. Like all the momentum. Thank you. Like, yeah. Thank you. We're, yeah, I'm in. Like, I love it. It's very, very nice to watch it and to be yeah. a part of it. And like, I don't know a lot about wine. Like, 
I always have to drink wine, but yeah, like, um, you enjoy it. So <laughs> and over time, it will sink in. So this is really, really nice. Yeah. It will it sink in. Change. That's what the cool part I about it so. is. So. You'll see something you and you'll that, think. <laughs> well, that's, that's the kind of like it, it will sink in over time there are certain words that i'm like oh i've heard that before but like i'm like oh but then you don't hear it for a while and then somebody will say it and you're like oh what does that actually mean you know like what is that okay. so like that's so that's kind of like yeah. the more you're around it the more you absorb you know like it's just with everything in life you know it's just a practice yeah. you know okay. yeah <laughs> you've absorbed it Right. Yeah. I know, but this is like I love I love being a student and I love hearing it. But like whenever I go to drink a wine, it's like I know I like it, but I can't quite describe it. It'll just come yeah. in. It'll so that's you know you'll have that certain well, wine. My accent might be the wrong one or whatever, but it's um, just no such like, thing as that. It's a fun thing. Yeah. Yes, there is. Though, you know, and cheese and flavor in general. Like that's the thing all in the comments. Flavor. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's yeah. I'm glad you were here. Yeah. I'm so glad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm right here. Yes. It's not cheesy. <laughs> 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 Good friend of Lakes, I had moved to Germany, the one thing in Germany. She gets a job as a product manager for a big pharmaceutical, like high power corporate job. Mm -hmm. And um, they take a va vacation to Scotland and they go to the goat farm. <laughs> Fall in love with this goat farm. They decided to it. change their lives. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Buy a farm and go. Didn't even see it. They bought it online and everything else. Oh my God. Sold everything and uh, I moved all their stuff from Berlin. Or not. They're in Munich. They, they live in Munich. But they came back from Munich, sold everything, shipped what they, they could. And now uh, they, they run a farm. Uh, in where? Maine. Oh, okay. Okay. Maine. okay. Nice. Oh, I love it. The Maine the state, yeah. In the middle of it. When yeah. I first started in New York, in New York they are there. almost 20 years ago, so many bankers and yeah. so many people that were cashing yep. in um, their big Manhattan nice. hotshot jobs were buying little goat or sheep farms yeah. in New Hampshire yeah, or that's Maine. That's or, a lot of work, too. Yeah. Yeah. You're just, like, living on the... Right. Yeah, you know? Well, yeah. If mm -hmm. you have any dairy, any farmers in your in your family, you know it's a 24-7 oh, thing. Yeah. Totally. Yes, you've yes, there you you know, it's a 24 sometime. You know, you got to check all the equipment to make sure it's all running. Depend I grew up with family that were dairy farmers, also turkey farmers and chicken farmers. All that equipment you've got to fix yourself or you got to pay high dollars to, yeah. it's just got to be a jack of all yeah. trades no. or yeah. be, a, be able to you afford. You, 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 you have like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to these countries. Yeah. And I've heard that before. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but Maine is beautiful, and in oh, Munson, yeah. you have you have the best blueberries. Because I'm from New England, so I know Maine and New Hampshire very well. Yeah. Dairy goats? Are they are they making cheese or, or selling milk? Selling milk. Uh, she, she cheese. Okay. We're gonna say goodbye. <laughs> We're gonna say goodbye on the live. Bye. 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 Thank you for joining us. Don't, don't leave. Actually. We're just saying goodbye on the live. Goodbye for some questions. Okay. <laughs>